Today, we're going to talk about the biggest thing in the news right now, and that's the attempted assassination of uh, former President Trump. Now, we're the behavior panel. And today, that's what we're going to talk about mostly is behavior, not just body language. There'll be some body language in there as well, obviously, but it's mostly behavior we'll be focusing on today. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, what we're not looking at are the shooter or other people like that. What we're looking at is the crowd and how people responded and how they responded to threat. So what we hope you walk away with is some useful tools, some pointers and some tips that you can use when you're out in public and there could be a problem. Because we have millions and millions oh, of sure. people in our country that shouldn't be here. Look, they're all pointing. The Atlantic, maybe the Pacific. Yeah. yeah, someone's on top of the roof. Look. Gary is right there. Right there, see him? He's laying down, see him? Yeah, he's laying down. And so I'm here with you, fighting my tail to get a sentence. What's happening? And this guy's going to take back the land. Because if we do, we're going to make America better than other people. We're going to make it. Yeah, look, there he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. Dangerous people. Criminals. We have criminals. We have criminals. We have people that right should not be here. Right on the road. It's much tougher than it happens. Right on the road. All right, Greg, what do you got? We're going to talk a lot about behavior. So let's start with this one. When we talk about, Mark, you say it all the time, people naturally, when they have a blank, they'll fill in the, the most negative thing possible or fear. But something happens to people when they're in the presence of other people. Whereas a person might be alone and walking along, they might actually have one mindset that, hey, look, this is terrible, this is that. But because we have a social contract and what's acceptable in public, most people will not notice the same threat or will not react to that same threat the same way because they'll be called a name. You know, we have ways of ostracizing people who call out somebody and say, what's going on over there? You call them nosy. You might call them Karen. You might call them something else. But in fact, that is the most natural state of humans is to go, that doesn't look right. Why not? Watch these people all dance around that. And this is, by the way, it takes a certain amount of courage to go and say, look, that guy up there doesn't belong up there. Why is he up there? Somebody fix it. That takes courage. And we know about that because even in corporations, people have a tendency not to say the truth when they see it. It's the emperor's new clothes fable and all of that. They're not willing to because they're not willing to be ostracized. What happens here is you see people starting to build up, and then this woman is willing to boldly say, hey, look at that guy's right there. He doesn't belong up there. It took her a while. In the modern world, we're less likely to assign danger to something when we're in a public setting than unless we have some kind of past experience. I mean, I would say Chase and I probably both have more of a tendency to naturally look for threat. I, my wife always says, because of what we do, I'm always looking for somebody on the side of the road, throwing something out and looking to say, is that the size of a person? That's just in my DNA at this point because of what we do. But let's talk for a minute about some of the body language going on here. Now, we talked about this is behavior. Let me tell you, I, when I was, I, all my data is going to be circa 1990. I did a bodyguard or principal protection instructor qualification for SWIC, for Special Warfare Center, and taught for a while. And in those days, Maybe something's changed, but I never saw an, a, any agent crawl around on his belly and try to keep a low profile. They try to keep a low profile when they're, when there's something coming back. He also would be in a uniform because we need to be able to identify threat from somewhere else. This guy's crawling around on his belly. He's looking secretive. He doesn't have any uniform. He has no markers. That ain't a good guy. And so give yourself permission to call out something like that. I'm not saying shoot the guy, but I'm saying call out. That guy looks dangerous. He's trying to keep his body out of that silhouette. And that's not what typically security guys do, Chase. We know that's happening when somebody's firing back at us, but not when we're trying to get in position because we don't need to. We're traveling together. Um, one last thing I'll leave you with. There's a big difference between being, and you need to think like an anti-terrorism guy. There's two different things. Chase was in counter-terror, where they go out and thump the guys in their homes who are trying to do something to us. All right, as I'm sure you can imagine, the shooting at the Trump rally in Pennsylvania has generated a lot of controversy in the media, contributing to an already polarizing landscape. This is why we reached out to Ground News to sponsor this video. Their app and their website let us get the full picture on what's happening. They combine the news from around the world so you can get context on the source of the information. So let's look closer at the coverage on President Trump's attempted assassination. 
Ground News gives me instant access to more than 700 articles reporting on it all over the world with context on each publication's political bias, factuality, based on how subjective or objective their language is, and even who is funding those people. So comparing news coverage is just fascinating to me. So left-leaning USA Today and uh, ABC News downplayed the shooting by writing that Trump was removed from stage after loud noises startled him and rang out in the crowd. The Irish Times went as far as victim blaming, adding that the assassination attempt might even help him win the White House. So right-leaning outlets like the Daily Signal and New York Post were really quick to call out liberal media's despicable coverage, reporting that their bias was on full display. And unfortunately, moments like these can cause polarizing and often very inaccurate narratives to spread really fast. And you wouldn't know unless you stayed informed through really diverse news sources, something ground news simplifies and excels at. And with media bias just running crazy like it is, I can't recommend subscribing to Ground News enough to stay fully informed on topics that, especially ones that tend to go from zero to ridiculous in no time at all, like Donald Trump or the 2024 elections. I am personally in the process right now of writing a book on elite media brainwashing, and Ground News is one of the most practical solutions I have ever seen. So go to ground.news slash TBP, or just scan the QR code on the screen right here. And right now, they're offering our subscribers for the behavior panel the same vantage plan that I use same plan for unlimited access to all their features. So subscribing not only supports an independent news platform that's working to make media more transparent, the entire landscape more transparent, you're going to be supporting the behavior panel as well. What we always teach guys is the anti-terror piece, making yourself a hard target, paying attention to what's going on around you, looking and not bowing to social pressure, but calling out and saying, what's going on right there? I'm going to give you a story. When I was 16 years old, I worked in a, in a Kentucky Fried Chicken for about eight weeks. Hated that job every minute of it. I was out back one time pouring some grease out. And this woman, middle-aged woman, comes walk, comes running up the hill going, stop him, stop him. There's a young guy a little older than me who was running up the hill, and I ran after him. Just my DNA. This older woman screaming, stop. He's not stopping. I started running after him. He kept running. He must be a bad guy. He outran me. I was a little fat kid. He outran me down the alley. And I was lucky because I found out later he had had a firearm and he had robbed a business and she was trying to get somebody to stop him. That's a DNA thing for people who move into action versus those who pull out. So let's pay attention to the crowds and see what we get as we go forward. Scott, what do you got? All right. I understand why these people did this and why, why nothing happened I mean, with people standing around down there on the ground because they see something happen like what you're talking about, Greg. But they don't. Number one, they don't know what to do except stand there and go, should we do this? What's going on? And they talk to everybody first, and then they start making decisions about whether they should do something or not. And these days, if you say the wrong thing, the wrong person, or if you said something 15 years ago that was quote unquote wrong, you get canceled or suffer, you know, uh, the, the consequences of being canceled, you know, socially, you'd be socially, you know, excommunicated from, or whatever the proper term would be from everybody. So you have to be kind of careful. And these people don't know what to look for. They're just seeing that, you know, they they could, because when you see that, you say that could be a cop, that could be the secret service because they're everywhere. It, and it doesn't look like what I think a sniper should look like from movies and TV shows and stuff. They're always in a chair in the back of a, a room and there's a window that's way far back. You go, wow, I can't believe that's the way they're doing that. It's things like that. So then you have that group mentality of of whether whether I want to to tell everybody what's going on because I'm look like an idiot if I'm wrong, you know. And if you don't, and something goes wrong, you know. But there's a lot of us there, so it's not just me that would get blamed for that. And there's a thing. There's a term called pluralistic ignorance. That's where you have a lot of people in a situation and something's going wrong, but nobody's really checking with anybody because they feel foolish to say what they think is happening. The place is on fire. For example, there was a place called a situation called the Happy Land Fire that was in the that happened in the Bronx back, I think, in the 90s. And 87 people burned up in this in this building and like a private club because 
Uh, this guy was mad at his girlfriend who worked there, and he set it on fire with gas and stuff, you know, went up and, and torched it. And the people in there, nobody was saying a whole lot because they felt foolish to say something. So that, and it's also called the bystander effect when that happens. And all these people died because nobody said, hey, man, everything's on, the, the place is on fire. One time I was going to Greg's and I was, as I was driving uh, to his place, I saw a bunch of smoke, you know, up the road as I was coming toward. I said, oh, I better, that's going back to the DNA thing, Greg, better pull in and make sure everything's okay because there's a lot of smoke, you know. And as the closer I got, I saw flames coming out, shooting out of the top of this gas station, like this gas station mini mart thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a Bucky's that big, but it was, it was, it wasn't small, you know. Mm-hmm. So I go running in and I said, hey, your place is on fire. You know, there's a fire up there. And nobody just kind of looked at me. And I said, this place is on fire, you know, and everybody just kind of looked at me. And I said, hey, man, your place is on fire. Everybody in here needs to get out. And finally, he was like, well, OK. And they started gathering people up. Oh, it blew my mind that nobody went, oh, no, we need to get out of here. They were all just standing around looking at me like I was crazy, you know, which is the nightmare these people have when they want to say, oh, there's a shooter up there. The guy's got a gun or should he be up there? So I, I get it. I've seen I've seen in person people doing that. So but but still it it's. I get what they're doing. I understand why all, we all do. We all understand what happened. But it's it's understandable, because, especially due to the things that are happening today in, in society. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so in the UK, where I used to live, uh, terrorism has been a long, long history. Uh, personally, I've been blown up a couple of times. I don't advise anybody to be part of that. It's particularly uh, nasty. So we have something in the UK, a phrase, which is, if you see something, say something. And you'll hear that on the London Underground constantly. If you see something, say something. There's a lovely voice of a, a lovely lady in dulcet tones telling you this. Now, why is this important? Because just as everybody has said so far, and I'm sure Chase will reiterate as well, there's this social contagion that has to happen for people to get up the courage to go, you know what, I don't think this is right. And even then, Scott, to your point of, hey, there's a fire, sometimes uh, people need instruction. They want to know, well, okay, there's a fire, but what do I do? So eventually you have to say, Get out, move, 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 or phone the police or call an ambulance. You you have to give instruction to people. And what we see in this, you know, quite quite rightly for the situation they're in, is people going, yeah, I, I think that's wrong. And I think this is, but, but there's no idea of here's what we should do. You know, phone the police right now. Go over and get that officer immediately. Everybody wave frantically at the, <laughs> the snipers on the roof to, to direct them. So, and, and why would they? Why would they know how to do that? You know, the best the UK has is if you see something, say something. So to, so to counteract that mm-hmm. sense of I will be punished in some way if I step out of line and I just don't keep on walking. Now, so what interests me most about this situation here is what exactly do they see? What exactly is out of the ordinary here? And it's very stark for me. If you look at everybody else, uh, other than the person on the roof, everybody else is down low. They're low. They're on the ground and they're all standing upright. And there's one person in this who is up high and is lying down. Now, that's a big discrepancy. They're up high and lying down. Everybody else is down low and standing up. And that, for me, is the big discrepancy. When you look around everybody and you go, well, hang on, that's out of place. That's odd. Now, why why might somebody be up high and down low? Well, I mean, there are very many various reasons, but it's very, very out of place. So when you see something very, very out of place or even subtly out of place. You have to bring on that sense of if you see something, say something, because otherwise you're most likely to conform to saying nothing and doing nothing. And and I wouldn't blame you if you did, because that's social conformity, essentially. Uh, Chase, what do you see on this one? Great points, uh, everybody. I'd like to just dissect the bystander effect. Let's talk about why it happens. What's the reason that it happens? And the first one is a shared responsibility. 
when there's a lot of people around, we feel less responsible. And this involves part of our brain called the ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex, which are very key in decision making. So their activity drops when there's other people around, the activity in those two brain regions drops. So it reduces the urge to act. Second, especially in today's world, uh, we have a fear of judgment. If I'm the first one to stand out or step out from the crowd, I naturally feel fear. This is the reason public speaking is the number one fear. We fear judgment. So uh, it really activates the amygdala and motivates us away from doing stuff. And we follow others. What you'll see in this clip when it comes back is people looking left and right everywhere. And this is what I call herd checking. I've, I've been on nine deployments. I've seen lots of crazy stuff going on. And in crowds, when something starts happening, you see left, right gaze. What is the rest of my herd doing? And how can I do what they do to stay safe? You'll see this in, in groups of deer. You'll see it in turkeys. You'll see it in all kinds of animals, including us. Uh, so this in, involves our mirror neurons, which help us to uh, empathize and, and mimic actions. And in today's world, there's a lot of people that often film emergencies instead of calling 911. And I think most of the, some of this is because our culture is so focused on instant gratification and social validation. And it's easier and more rewarding to capture and share videos for likes and comments than it is to take action in that in most of people's heads. But we also assume somebody's going to come to help. Somebody's going to take charge of this. And this is called the, the technical name of the bystander effect is called diffusion of responsibility. So our smartphones make filming so simple and experiencing life through screens has created a psychological distance. And this uh, allure of capturing some viral moment can almost be irresistible. All that's piling up and we're faced with an emergency. The bystander effect kicks in due to the ACC and PFC that reduces our responsibility. So that's really what we're seeing here. But pay attention to these people looking left and right and frozen in place. And now here's one question I want you to process in your head. If they ask those people before the event, do you know what to do if shots ring out? Or would you instantly know how to take action if an emergency happened? A hundred percent of them are like, yeah, I got it. I've got it figured out. And then you see the results in real life. So a lot of us have that cognitive bias about ourselves. Uh, if I've been shot at, Greg's been shot at, Scott's been cursed at once or a couple times. <laughs> yeah. But he, so, but I'm okay. <laughs> and, and my first time I I <laughs> he froze even go, having gone through training for that kind of stuff, I froze for a few seconds. So that does happen, but we all tend to think in our in our own mind that won't happen to me. I'm not the freezing type. I I know what happens in an emergency. So the best way to get vaccinated against that little bias in your head is to be very aware of the fact that it's there, that the bystander effect exists and that it's almost hardwired into our bodies. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. Look, they're all pointing. The Atlantic, maybe the Pacific. Yeah. yeah, someone's on top of the roof, look. There he is right there. Right there, see him? He's laying down. See him? Yeah, he's laying down. And so I'm here with you, fighting my tail to get a sentence. What's happening? And this guy's going to take back the land because if we do, we're going to make America better than other people. We're going to make it. Yeah, look. There he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. Dangerous people. Criminals. We have criminals. We have. We have people that right should not be here. Right on the road. It's much tougher than it happens. Right on the road. Dasha, first, good morning. You, you know, I know you've told the story a couple times now. You, you've sort of set the scene of what you saw. W when you were watching it in real time, did, did you understand, did you register what was happening? No, I mean, Tom, like so many people that we talked to in the aftermath, initially we thought it was fireworks. You know, the former president's rallies sometimes have pyrotechnics, sometimes smoke, sometimes some, some sort of fireworks and flares. So that was 
my initial thinking. I mean, you never jump first to the conclusion that this was an act of political violence, but it was it was when those those pop pop pops kept going and the former president stopped talking that it felt like, oh, wait, this is not something that was expected. This could potentially be dangerous. So it, it went from a sort of initial uh, confusion and chaos to a bit of adrenaline and fear starting to settle in. My producer, Bianca, and I were just coming off of the press risers, walking down the stairs when those initial sounds that are now sort of keep echoing through my mind uh, went off. And we took cover behind some stage equipment, big boxes of stage equipment once we realized this could be something dangerous. Although, Tom, I'll tell you, even as I was taking cover, I was thinking, this is just a precaution. We're just doing this to be safe. We're going to come up and realize it was uh, fireworks or some some something not what we ultimately uh, realized was was the reality of, of political yeah. violence here. Um, and, Josh, I want and you to explain to our viewers, to if you can yeah, I want you to explain to our viewers, if you can, just how close. All right, Chase, what do you got? So these initial sounds were mistaken for fireworks. This is a very common occurrence at events uh, showing uh, us, all of us, how people often misinterpret unfamiliar situations based on context. Our brains use past experiences to make shortcuts and our brains are good at making shortcuts and shortcuts help us. That's the reason we tie our shoes, we can drive and all that. So our brain makes these shortcuts to recognize something from our past or something we've seen on TV. When you look at the clips from the people who could see the shooter, the people who looked at him on the roof, you'll notice they reacted to the shooting much faster because their brains had a new context to filter information through. And you also see a few of the people I would bet good money are combat vets in that crowd. And I would say there's a few reasons why you can pick them out in a crowd. Number one is a conditioned response. They know that sound. And I think any combat veteran you will ever talk to knows the difference between a firework and a gun instantaneously. So it's a conditioned response, especially if you've been shot at. And the second is experience and muscle memory. Our body kind of goes through all of that. Then we have heightened situational awareness, which comes with all of that. And the vets, uh, especially combat vets, have a lower threshold for threat detection. There's a lower threshold for that. And there's a stress response calibration there. So combat veterans in the crowd reacted almost immediately to gunfire because their training and experience have conditioned them to do that. And they're used to recognizing that distinct sound very quickly. And their brains are, are primed to detect threats faster with a lower threshold for recognizing danger. And veterans uh, or, or people who are on active duty, manage their stress responses effectively in these kind of situations and allows them to stay more composed than most people. And I think this combination makes you instantly able to identify. I, I clicked play on here this morning and just watched the clip, and I could spot, I could hit pause right there and count all those little dots and say, that, that dude's been shot at, that guy's been in the Middle East or combat. And I think the initial misrepresentation of the gunfire uh, is very understandable for a lot of people. And those vets instantly, I think, knew what it was. Because when you hear that, then you can hear something whip through the air, and then you hear a thud or an impact somewhere else right in, in quick succession. Uh, every veteran has heard that. Every combat vet has heard that. Uh, and that's what you can see in this clip here. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things. I think the most important one that we both know is by the time you hear it, it's too late. <laughs> the rounds are already there by the time you hear it. That's just the nature that's, of what we that's do. That's also the, when you say what's the difference in a banjo and a hand grenade. If you hear either one of them, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So what, one of the things is that <clears throat> the other problem with sound, the other problem with the sound is if you've been around farms and you've only shot, you've never been in a place where rounds are moving, you've never heard it from a distance. You've heard up close and they're loud. Most people would think an AR is loud because they've fired it. They've never heard it firing around them um, or they've been in a range. But when you've been around them, you can pick out an AK from an AR. Chase, I know you can. 
you pick that sound out very there's very specifically those different sounds and the primary thing about all of that is your brain needs a box to put data in if you've only heard it up close or you've only heard it in the movies you've only you don't have a box to say oh that's this and if you have in your head those fireworks from past places you've assigned all kinds of information so we're talking about a woman here who articulates thought for a living. That's what she does. She collects experiences, turns those into a story and passes it on. And where she has a verbal image of anything she's dealing with, she loses that here. We always tell you residual emotion is powerful. Look at all that blinking, that adapting, moving, and swallowing from that residual emotion. And even down to an um, here's a reporter saying um. That's not typical of a reporter. So all that residual emotion is affecting her. And the single most important trait that you pick up in military, or like I had a friend named Gina Cavallero, who was a Cavallero, who was a uh, an embed reporter from the Military Times. She has all the situational awareness of any combat vet because she is a combat vet. So when we say that it's not just people who are using firearms, it's also people who have been in that situation. Those things always come back. And I, I'm reminded of one time when I was at my brother's house in like 92, after the war's over and all that. And he lived in a neighborhood where there was some gunfire occasionally. I was in his living room asleep on the couch and his kids are around. They're three and four and raising hell, making all kinds of noise. And there was a gunfire. And I woke up and sat up in the in the room. And my sister-in-law said, wow, that was pretty incredible. Through all that noise, you heard that one thing. I said, yeah, that's not a threat. This is a threat. And I ch chase you 100% on. All that details that revolve around things that you've been experienced will train your brain to know the difference. Now, you don't have to wait for that. What you can do is go listen to what gunfire sounds like from a distance. So you know the difference between fireworks. Fireworks don't sound at all like, like especially like an AR fire, that kind of thing. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, no, totally agree. So, uh, look, most of of the of a human's idea around what a gun is going to sound like has probably come from Hollywood films, and that effect is done in foley, which is like it's 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 unlikely anybody's shooting a gun at all. It's going to be made up of all kinds of other sounds to give you the best feeling of a gunshot in the environment that it's being shot in. That's that's a made up thing. It's so so most of our ideas around what a gun sounds like. Like, it's just made up. So it's absolutely accurate that this reporter is going to say, you know, and, and her eyes close and she goes down into her memories. She tries to rehear this. And we see these illustrators happen here as well of pop, pop, pop the pop, pop, popping that, that goes on. Now, you know, that's not my Hollywood idea of a, of a gun. I wanted the full on, you know, Jamaican booyah of the, of the thing going off in, <laughs> in, in close proximity, you know, and, so, and I don't get that. So what is it easy for me to do? It's easy for me to go, oh, well, there, then there weren't real gunshots, were there? If a reporter doesn't report the sound that I'm expecting reporting, then I got to fill that gap with some other idea to the negative, okay, this reporter must be making this up. If it's being made up, then some some people are planning elsewhere to make to create a theater of this. Well, I'm not saying that may not be the case, but we can't extrapolate that from this reporter right now who is absolutely convinced that she heard pop, 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 because undoubtedly that's what she heard. And most people went, well, that's fireworks, because from what I hear, fireworks do get set off at these events. And so, and, and maybe people had been at one of these events before. And so most people are going to go, okay, um, you know, our, our, our brain is not a knowledge machine. It's a it's a best fit machine. It's coming up with our best idea of what something may be based on the past. And that's what's happened here. So I wouldn't look at any of this and go, well, there's no credibility there. There's absolute credibility here from the reporter, which is why in some news agencies, you may have seen early on the news agencies going, you know, there was a pop, pop, pop. You know, and and because that's what the person on the ground who was a reporter had said there was. So they weren't able to report there's an assassination because the first reports they're getting is there's some popping sounds around. 
and, and the president's being taken away. That's the first reports that they get until further down the line where we would expect they're being more and more accurate as they get more and more credible information. I think this is a credible report. Uh, she finally says, not that we ultimately... Uh, not that we ultimately realised was really a pol- um, uh, was really political violence, and she <laughs> regains her composure around that. She moderates her emotion. There's a deep breath there. There's a hard swallow, just as you said, Greg. So, so she is very, very adamant about political violence here. She's emotional about that, and she's trying to regain her emotions around this credible report, as far as I'm concerned. Scott, what do you got on this one? And everybody's been talking about the way gunshots sound. And we all know in a, a room or in a building, gunshots don't sound like you think they're going to sound either. Because in a building, if you're outside the building, it's more of a, a this weird thud kind of sound, like a blocky thud sound. But if you're in the room, you know, and that changes once you hear the first one, then your ears start shutting down. And that sounds differently. It's, don't get me wrong. It's still loud. But your your ears react to that differently because they're already starting to shut down because it's a dang loud in there from that from that first one. And I think I think she does a great job of of keeping it together while she's re re replaying what happened. Because when you're talking to a witness like this, they've got to go in and, and go step by step what they remember that happened. And we know memories, even the fr- you know first person, only person um, witness, you know eyewitness. A lot of times that's just not right. But I don't think I'm not questioning her at all here. So I'm saying, but I think I think we're seeing everything on her that we should see for somebody who's telling us exactly what happened and exactly what it was to them. Because I think all of y'all hit it. You know, we're talking we're talking about emotions there. We're talking about the body language of that. Talking about the situation and what everybody else was thinking at the same time. You know, so I think I think she's uh, she's she's obviously being honest. But I mean, I think she's putting that across really well but she was she looked a little bit nervous and this is somebody that shouldn't be nervous you know that that she was a little uptight about because i'm sure when it was over it scared the you know what out of her when you go oh my gosh i could have been this guy that's you know laying up there in the bleachers bless that fireman's heart you know it could have been anybody there when you deal with somebody like that or the guy could have turned and started doing that to the to everyone there like that guy did in las vegas you just you dang you just never know you know and I do you guys before you and I think we've talked about this when we were doing when we've been doing stuff as a group somewhere. Does anybody here get nervous before you speak? Because I, I know Chase, you're talking about how it's the it's, it is the thing people fear most is going out and, and speaking. Does anybody get that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you do. I, I used to, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I curse myself for even having got myself into the situation that I'm about to go on stage in front of three thousand people. Okay, you in. Yeah, it depends. What have you done now? Some days, some days. I never get that. I, well, psychopaths, well, had, psychopaths have that, um, Scott. That's, let me write that yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Dasha, first, good morning. You, you know, I know you've told the story a couple times now. You, you've sort of set the scene of what you saw. When you were watching it in real time, did, did you understand, did you register what was happening? No, I mean, Tom, like so many people that we talked to in the aftermath, initially we thought it was fireworks. You know, the former president's rallies sometimes have pyrotechnics, sometimes smoke, sometimes some some sort of fireworks and flares. So that was my initial thinking. I mean, you never jump first to the conclusion that this was an act of political violence. But it was it was when those those pop, pop, pops kept going and the former president stopped talking that it felt like, oh, wait, this is not something that was expected. This could potentially be dangerous. So it it went from a sort of initial uh, confusion and chaos to a bit of adrenaline and fear starting to settle in. My producer, Bianca, and I were just coming off of the press risers, walking down the stairs when those initial sounds that are now sort of keep echoing through my mind uh, went off. And we took cover behind some stage equipment, big boxes of stage equipment once we realized this could be something dangerous. Although, Tom, I'll tell you, even as I was taking cover, I was thinking, this is just a precaution. We're just doing this to be safe. We're going to come up and realize it was uh, fireworks or some some something not what we 
ultimately uh, realized was was the reality of, of political yeah. violence here. Um, and, Josh, I and want you to explain to our viewers, to if you can. Yeah, I want you to explain to our viewers, if you can, just how close. And that's the point where they're like, I don't know this material. I'm going to get found out. I got I got nervous one time. <clears throat> when these, I was talking to, and this is the same place I accidentally dropped the F bomb the, the second time I was there. <laughs> when I was, the first time I was there, there was a, this table full of women because it was one of those hotels where everybody's sitting at the table and you go, ah, here's, you know, you talk. And every time I'd walk close to this table, these women would start frowning at me and they'd look disgusted and all that, you know? And so, and then I'd walk away and I'd check the table and they would, they would settle down a little bit. And the closer I got to them over there, the more they get all worked up. So it was over, you know, how you, you say, anybody got questions, that kind of thing, you know? So I said, anybody got questions? I got a few minutes and I asked some questions. Every table, every hand at the table goes up. So I go over there and I said, ma'am, do you have a question? She goes like this. She goes, we know about the commode. I said, what? She said, we know about the commode. I don't know what happened to the commode there or somebody did something to commode. It wasn't me. I still don't know. Never found out. <laughs> I want to bring in Leonard Verdetto, who was at the Trump rally yesterday when the attempted assassination happened. Leonard, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad that you are okay. Uh, and just talk to me a little bit about what happened yesterday. You say you were in the stands near the Jumbotron. Can you tell me what you saw and heard? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for having me on. My prayers and condolences go towards the, the victims, the families. So we uh, say our prayers to them and also say our prayers to the former president and his family so they could be safe. Um, but being in the stands, um, what it was like is, you know, it sounded like popping noises that were going off. And, it, and what happened was it, it just happened so fast. You know, people were saying, get, you know, duck, duck. I was saying, duck, get down. Even other people were. So we're protecting each other. We're praying with each other. And then I look up. And I basically see, you know, someone down. Um, there was blood on a couple of people. I look up to my left side. I see the former president. He's down with the Secret Service. So um, it was a lot of things that were happening at once. So it, it was a lot to gather. So it was something that you weren't expecting because the people were there to um, to stand for what they, you know, uh, stand for, you know. And, you know, there was a lot of good commotion. Um, but that's something that we weren't expecting. So, how did you feel once you realized that the popping sound that you described were actual gunshots? Uh, be honest with you, it, it sounded like firecrackers, really. You know, but but then would realize and like, oh man, it's, shots were happening. That's when we actually duck. So we came to full solution, like, oh, this is this is shooting that's happening. So it was like I said, it was so unexpected. Leonard, have you now gone back and watched video uh, of what happened? And what's your reaction when you see it from that angle? All right, Greg, what do you got? Another popping noises. So these guys are all saying popping noises. If they were trained to know what the sound is, it would be scrambling and trying to get away from something. I think both Chase and I, if we're not armed, we're going to be trying to figure out ways to protect our family or do something else because we know it. What's interesting is I think I'm going to go based on my 30-year-old experience on what bodyguards do. When you're with the Secret Service, there's an AIC, an agent in charge, and that guy owns everything. He owns air, he owns perimeter, she, he, whatever, owns all of that and how everything interacts, counter shooters, all that. But those guys who are principal, the guys who are there to protect that guy, have one role, and that's to protect that guy from gunfire. You see them do it. Once he hits the ground, bodies over them. They're not even worried about themselves. They're not looking around. They're trying to protect him, and they're trying to cover his body with flesh at every turn. I remember when I went through the course, they were saying, you got to really appreciate the job or you got to really believe in the person because you're putting your life in harm's way. That's what they do. You'll hear that, see the woman. She's struggling with a pistol, all that stuff. There's no place in this guy's brain for this could be, could be gunfire. And if you want to know the truth, watch him. When he actually says gunfire, watch his brow rise up, residual emotion. So... I, and Chase, I'm going to leave you to talk about social pressure, possibly. But even if he were to stand up and go, he's got a gun and look stupid, there's actually, I, I would say a little mocking for saying something is probably a cheap price for human life. Worked with a guy a long time ago who was running a project for a hospital. He was a goofball of a guy, a project manager. And so these guys thought it'd be really funny to put smoke bombs in a bag and put them in this hospital they were building up on the side. And this kid went out and stomped these things out and look stupid. And they were making fun of him. 
But imagine if that were a real fire in a real hospital and he was in a hospital. Was it worth that mocking? Probably. So practical jokes aside, if, if it turned out not to be a thing and you said, hey, somebody's got a gun, they're shooting, get down, would be a powerful thing. I just don't think you had a place in this head for it. Mark, what do you see? Is that for me? Mark. Oh, yeah, Mark, what do you, see? <laughs> you cut out. Sorry, you cut I, out I pointed the wrong way, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what do I see? Okay, so the main thing I see here, which is really interesting, right at the end of it, you see the, the crowd... Uh, a, a mass wave of, of ducking and coming up again. It's a real wave. Everybody seems together. You see this contagion in an instant of everybody going down and people coming up again. That's really interesting because it feels and looks from a distance like everybody's together on this. When we go to another video later on of the same thing, but in close up, what you're going to see is a whole variety of behaviors, a whole variety of some people ducking later than other people, some people not ducking at all, some people getting their phones out, some people not, some people getting their phones out later, maybe, you know, uh, half a second later than somebody else. There's a variety of action, yet in the big grand shot, it looks and feels like everybody is together. And that's the beauty of behavior is you have to be able to pull back and reveal. You have to be able to move away from something and go, okay, in the grand scheme of things, what's happening here? And then you have to be able to go in into the detail and go, and the individual human beings, what's their differentiation? Knowing that the big pack from a grand scale, seem to be behaving in very much the same way. So that's really interesting. Again, another pullback and reveal is when you go into close-up of, of um, Trump being shot, uh, first of all, and it looks like, if you just look at the periphery, like his bodyguards turn up pretty late. You go, oh, they're not ready because you miss the three people who come up from the back and jump on, it, on, on him immediately. They're quite hard to see. As you see the people come up from the side, understand he's already covered by three people, which are really hard to notice when you're looking at the big picture. Yeah, Chase. I think you're doing video four. Uh, no, I was doing two. I was doing two because at the end of that is a crowd shot. This is video three. Uh there's activity in the middle yeah, of this. There's activity in the middle of it, yeah. Of three. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's interrupt. all right. No, it's okay. It's okay. No, good, good to good to call it out. I'm I'm focusing on because the interview for me, um, yeah, it's it's not so interesting as the crowds, you know, outside of that. Um, yeah, that's all I got to say uh on that one. Oh, but just one last thing. Yeah, what is interesting from the interview point of view point of view is that uh, she instantly goes into, uh, sorry, he uh, instantly goes into present tense for that. Uh, asked a question about the past. He goes straight into this, uh, that, that reliving that moment. It's a very bland, um, unpoetic uh, interview and description. But what is interesting is the present tense that's gone into there. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? I think the amazing part of this one is that quite often when someone is presented in a situation like this, they'll drop into a coma after listening to somebody talk like this for about two minutes. It, I don't know if it's it takes me able to touch on the hypnotizing thing or whatever, but this kind of thing, I didn't get halfway through it either. Shifts. <laughs> That's why I thought it was on the wrong <laughs> video too. I just couldn't take it. I couldn't listen to him anymore. I apologize, but I, I just, I, I, I couldn't do it. You know, cause I was sitting there, I was going, I was about to fall over. This cat's hypnotizing me, man. But uh, yeah, so, I'll, and I've got stuff I'll talk about the, the crowd in the next one. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> I don't have anything. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring in Leonard Verdetto, who was at the Trump rally yesterday when the attempted assassination happened. Leonard, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad that you are OK. Uh, and just talk to me a little bit about what happened yesterday. You say you were in the stands near the Jumbotron. Can you tell me what you saw and heard? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for having me on. My prayers and condolences go towards the, the victims, the families. So we've uh, say our prayers to them and also say our prayers to the former president and his family so they could be safe. Um, but being in the stands, um, what it was like is, you know, it sounded like popping noises that were going off. And, it, and what happened was it, it just happened so fast. You know, people were saying, get, you know, duck, duck. I was saying, duck, get down. Even other people were. So we're protecting each other. We're praying with each other. And then I look up 
And I basically see, you know, someone down. Um, there was blood on a couple of people. I look up to my left side. I see the former president. He's down with the Secret Service. So um, it was a lot of things that were happening at once. So it, it was a lot to gather. So it was something that you weren't expecting because the people were there to um, to stand for what they, you know, uh, stand for, you know, and, you know, there was a lot of good commotion, um, but that's something that we weren't expecting. So how did you feel once you realized that the popping sound that you described were actual gunshots? Uh, be honest with you, we, it, it sounded like firecrackers, really, you know, but but then we're realizing like, oh, man, it's, shots were happening. That's when we actually duck. So we came to full solution like, oh, this is this is shooting that's happening. So it was like I said, it was so unexpected. Leonard, have you now gone back and watched video uh, of what happened? And what's your reaction when you see it from that angle? <laughs> first on this one there's one guy in this whole thing that that ended up being my very favorite one and I, i'll get to him and i've already told you guys who it is but i'll get to that in just a minute but this thing breaks down for me it's three examples of of what we're seeing here three types of reactions we're seeing here we're seeing the that immediate reaction when the noise the obviously when the noise starts when the when the Gunshots start, people automatically duck down like that. They don't know what it is. They don't even think gunshot or anything. That's just what you do as, as an animal. And something loud happens, that's the first thing you do, especially in a, in a group like that, right? And the second one is the, the delayed reaction where the gunshots happen and people sit there for a minute and then they slowly get down and start because they're copying everyone else. They're copying, you know, the group or what, mimicking the group or whatever. Then you have the casual observer, which gets to my favorite one. I don't know what else to call him, but this hobo hillbilly looking guy, or, or I don't know, he's wearing all black, has the hat on. This the is hippie. <laughs> the hippie hobo or whatever. This guy, man, either he's like, the, he's just a dang gangster, right? Or he's just not very smart because he just stands there looking around the whole time, which a lot of people do. They become the observer of the situation, no matter how horrible it is. And one of the main things you see, I think, when people start ducking down, like you guys are saying, man, you can spot the guys who, who are in the military or have been in there because they get down quick and they, their heads are forward, but they get down quick and they're looking around, especially with that, that fireman that, that got killed. You know, he hears it. First thing he does is jump on his family. You know, thank God he did. You know, so they didn't get tagged, but he did. You know, so I, I think it's it's a it's a great example of, of that to see. Every, not everything that can happen, but but the diff, the various situations that happen when something is uh, introduced into a situation with a lot of people like that, and they're all fans of, uh, of Trump. You know, they're all into it. You know, and I think and we're going to talk about the the phones coming out here in a few minutes. But some people that had, I think, I won't touch that since I know you guys are going to get into it. But um, I I thought that was fascinating. The, the, those three examples. Uh, of the, the reactions of people. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Super uh, horrifying thing to watch and just an epic time in history. And it it really shows 
how just the power of that crowd uh, when he stood up was incredible to watch just as a crowd had having no idea whether someone had just died in front of their eyes, the, the, the potential future president died in front of their eyes. And watching them come back from that was just amazing. Uh, no matter what side of the aisle it was on, it's it's uh, great to watch. And I just thought it was interesting watching the body language of the people there. And uh, I only saw one anomaly. And it was just the only person, there was only one person I could spot that displayed uh, maybe two. And Scott, to your point, the guy that you were talking about, I think there's one more explanation that what I maybe would call just for YouTube purposes, the Cheech and Chong effect uh, might be at play right there. Yeah, that's true. And uh, there's only one person that had their phone at the ready, uh, which seemed like they didn't even need to hit the record button and have it ready to go, showed zero fear response. The shoulders didn't move. Facial muscles didn't move into fear. And there was no crowd checking, as well as 41 other indicators for this one person. Uh, that so much, I'm making a video about it on my channel this week uh, with a couple other experts, but uh, I'll, I'll leave you to figure out who that was. Uh, Greg, what do you got? So we're going to go back to the thing I said earlier. It's in your DNA to do certain things. This guy that we were talking about, this fireman, I'm going to try to pronounce his name correctly, but I think it's Corey uh, Compatori. And he did what a lot of people in those businesses are going to do. A guy who has made his whole life protecting others, protected his family with his own life. Meanwhile, these other people are trying to protect, back to what I told you earlier, they're human blanketing Trump, protecting him, these secret service agents. And you may assign blame to the woman for not being able to hit her holster. So what? So what? She's not going to engage a target if she drops Explain her Explain that real quick because they, they won't know. Trump. Yeah. I, well, here's the thing. When you're doing that role, your job is you're not rolling around looking for a shot. You're protecting. Watch where their faces are. They're protecting. They're looking for gaps in their protection of, of Trump so that they can, no one can get a bullet to him. Every, if you notice, everywhere there's an opening, they're putting a limb or something between them. When I went through the school, they would tell you, put the guy in the back floorboard, put a Kevlar blanket over him and lay on him. And don't worry about your back. Somebody else is shooting. That's not your job. That's why they have all these people here. So it depends on the role you play. And just remember that as part of this. There's also a couple of other personality types. And I think all of this is going to be tied to whether you got fight or flight, whether you're a person who has an amygdala that's hypersensitive, you freeze you may freeze. You may start to pay attention. Some people are so taken by shock that their brain can't register what they're doing or what they're seeing. That's why you see people with gashes in their forehead walking away from an automobile trying to look for their keys or do something odd because what they're doing is those routines, those neural pathways they already have established. And a lot of these guys, watching them just kind of squat down and look in terror, if I were on the back of those bleachers, I'm probably off the back. Because I'm going away somewhere, I can break an ankle, they can fix that. They don't fix gunshot wounds quite as easily. My favorite, and the whole bunch, everybody's going to have their favorite, is a guy standing and pointing, assigning blame. That reminds me of Jesse Jackson standing on the balcony of a hotel mm -hmm. when Martin Luther King was shot and assigning blame, saying, there's where he's at, get him. That's powerful. That is powerful. I'm going to go back to what I said in the beginning. There's two kinds of terror things. And Chase... The difference between what you would do and going after a terrorist is you're armed, you are got everything together. There's also a way of living in a, in a threat environment and learning to identify threat. And that is what people need to be doing. You're not going to be out hunting down bad guys. You're probably not going to – you know, rare occasion will you have the opportunity, even if you're an armed and carrying person, to counter fire. You need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to pay attention to what's going on. You need to train your brain. You need to train those neural paths for how to respond to threat. One, and now I'm going to give you one that Pyle said. Uh, well, and I'll also say one last thing. You guys talk about cameras. The mere fact that a person is willing to bring out a camera in a situation like this is a brand new thing in American life. And Chase, I'm going to go back and say something you said earlier. In some cases, they're valuing that viral video more than their own safety. That is an alien concept 10 years ago. It's something new in our world. I'm so just talk saying that the reward for doing that, yeah, bypassing this brain... And bypassing the mammalian brain yes. is like trying to hold your breath until you die. You can't do it. So like overriding the fear instinct has to be a reward that is extreme. Um, 
especially doing it right during the, the gunfire, during the gunfire. Agreed, oh, agreed. And, and I would that. say those neural paths had to be developed along the way so that you can you can't do that out, out of the blue. That dopamine release you've had right. from those neural paths all those times. If it's not criminal in nature, if it's criminal in nature, it's a different thing. We'll leave that at that. The last thing I'm going to share is I was talking to Pyle, and he pointed out my favorite. We'll call this type five. Watch the woman in very large glasses behind Trump's left shoulder disappear. It's like a magic trick, like Spidey was doing something. It's so good. So watch this, pay attention, and that's type number five. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so what I love about um, complex systems, especially complex systems of human beings, <clears throat> a bit like fluid dynamics, a bit, of, a bit like looking at clouds uh, in the sky, they're a bit of a Rorschach test, is, is that you'll see something that you'd like to see if there's the opportunity for it. And I think that's what's great about this, is we've seen all kinds of comments from all kinds of people, seeing all kinds of things that they might like to see in there. And then when you go into it and you go, well, hang on, though, I do see that over there as well, and I do see there that over there and that that does that same behavior does come a little bit later over there that's outside of the the scope they want to focus in and just go look here's the thing that i see right here and make a, a, a great story out of it and of course the story could be accurate of course the story could be accurate but it's often in these rorschach tests uh, most i guess indicative of the way they already see the world. And so lovely to see uh, what I was talking about before, what seems like a mass moving together, and then be able to go in detail and go, well, hang on, no, there's, there's so many different um, reactions to this, and some similar reactions, some moving all at the same time, some moving totally out of sync with everybody else. There's, I've seen stuff on social media about somebody nodding their heads, you know, and, and people going, well, that's them giving the saying it's all right to go. And yet three frames before, I see two other people nodding their heads. Well, what could be look like nodding their heads? And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a great test in can you look at individuals as individuals and go, why would that person rightly do that? And then look, we you know what nefarious may be happening. Can you suspend judgment? Can you use critical thinking and then come to a better idea of truly what might be happening here? You know, it is an extraordinary uh, event. And when we're, when we're not given an, a, a quick answer as to what went on here, of course, we're going to come up with all kinds of stories that make sense to us which could be could be true. Um, you know, I remember looking at that fantastic mm -hmm. image that Evan Vuki took, you know, which has that perfect um, uh, mount, I think it's Su, Su, Suibiachi, the, the flag at the angle in the background. And you go, and, 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 and Trump pumping the fist, and you go, but that is so perfect. It's so perfect brilliant that yes. has to be made up you can't put but no it's just somebody was there with the right equipment at the right time and got lucky and has taken one of the most brilliant photographs ever and if you know what it emulates what he managed to capture you go but he that must be a setup and it's not it's not a setup. It's just how life is. Life is chaotic. And sometimes in that chaos, something hits just right or just off, which, which is like, oh my God, it missed just. And we want to come up with reasons for, you know, because things can't be that perfect or that chaotic. And unfortunately, uh, in my view, they can. So, um, you know, it's 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 just as just as chancy that Trump didn't get hit as he got hit. It's just as chancy that we see people do all kinds of behaviors that that could be just unnefarious, ordinary behaviors for people in this chance situation, which we hope they would never get to see again. And that out of that comes the most 
perfect image, the most brilliant moment of art that probably Evan Fuji is just going, you know, who knew that that was going to happen to me, that I would get the most perfect photograph uh, of that. Uh, Extraordinary. Extraordinary. You know who else was a victim of the Rorschach test? Was the people in the field who randomly saw a guy crawling up a building and thought, that might be a big deal. And they were right. And they were right. They were right. And that's the beauty of life, isn't it? You make judgments and sometimes you're completely wrong and sometimes you're completely right. (laughs) It's like, you know, who can, if only you could know beforehand that you're either going to be completely right or completely wrong. But history plays out and you you find out in the for most of these episodes, I just call the psychic hotline. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've and listen and thank you for your money. It's been uh, it's yeah. been a great, it's been a great business, and you've been our main customer. And and we will be sending you a gift. Uh, very Scott, gift. Scott's dog psychic hotline. <laughs> so yes. that's why I want to. That's what I'm have Hattie on today. I want to talk about my new psychic dog channel, where we've all decided we're going to be dog psychics, and we want to help. <laughs> Take a look at the behavior in these videos. Mark, what have you seen up to this point? Uh, yeah, extra- extraordinary to see, extraordinary uh, event. Again, I go back to the, what's, what's brilliant for me about looking at behavior is trying to get closer to the truth of what might be going on and trying to be accurate about it. I think, again, when there's, when there's a, uh, a lack of information, we tend to want to fill that and fill that with what feels best for us, either in terms of the dramas that we like to see around us or the way we think the world works. Um, so we fill it with 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 story. Um, I will say, uh, you know, if you want it, I, I like a conspiracy theory as, as much as the next man. And if you do want to look up at the top of the bleachers, there is somebody wearing an ultra T-shirt. You'll all know what I'm talking about. Thomas Matthew Crooks is an anagram for hotshot scam workmate, mate, hotshot scam workmate. Now, I haven't put that into three words, but my guess is if I put that into three words, it'll come up with a location that is very, very important in you know the new world order of things. Investigate that for yourselves. Uh, but that's the way I like to see the clouds and the Rorschach test. Chase, what do you got on this one? If somebody goes to that location, Mark, and there's an obelisk, there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. will you agree now to fly there with me and do an episode? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. But, but but you know you can name locations. So I will go and find yeah. an obelisk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> so as you've been watching this video, you might have been wanting us to cover some other stuff that maybe you saw during this. Maybe you saw it on Twitter or X or TikTok or whatever. There's a lot of this stuff that's coming out. There's a lot of interviews coming out. And if something interesting and relevant to uh, people around the world comes out, we'll still cover it. So don't think this is the end of this debate or anything. We're covering what we know to be true. We're covering what we know is factual so far. We're going to keep it up to you. And we try to be, we don't try to be accurate. Or I don't, I try to be less wrong 
as less wrong as I possibly can. And we try to do that, and we try to do it with it entertaining and informing at the same time. We try to do that for you today. We definitely saw some interesting lessons that could potentially save your life or save somebody's life uh, in a crisis. And I think we could learn a lot from this, and I think there's a lot more to learn on the political side of this uh, as this unfolds over the next few weeks. Greg? Yeah, I think you just hit a key word. You know, what we're trying to do is to give you as much information as possible. And the thing that we, there's a famous, and I can't think of which Stoic philosopher said, if you don't know something, ask. You will look like a fool for once, but you'll have the information for the rest of your life. Anytime that something looks suspicious, it's okay to ask. You might look like a dork. So what? So what? People will forget that. What people will not forget typically is that you, what you will not forget is that you didn't ask and someone died as a result of it. Get smart. The world's a dangerous place. I say this to people all the time. You need to live in a threat zone. You're not a counter terror guy. You're not a guy who's going to be thumping somebody or using counter fire. But you are living in a dangerous world all around us. And it doesn't have to be political violence. There's violence going on all the time. Social pressure. And the emperor's new clothes make you not pay attention. And you just heard why. I mean, Chase did a great job of telling you in the biology of your brain why your brain is turning off parts. You don't need to know that. What you need to know is that your brain says, hey, I better be careful. I might look stupid. Looking stupid is okay every now and then. Scott, what do you see? I agree with you 100%. And this is, again, a great example of how a group reacts when a situation, a crisis arises. And we've seen examples pretty much of, of everything from the calm to the ones who know understand what's happening to people who have no earthly idea what's going on. And we're seeing how they react. We're watching the behavior of that in groups. Group behavior is fascinating. You know, and places like Disney have that figured out when they talk about crowd control and when they uh, control like, you know, thousands of people coming to one ride, what do they do, how do they do that? And uh, I, I think there's a lot of things in this thing can be studied. Everything from the the Secret Service response to the uh, the police response to and the people, of course, in that little crowd back there, that response. And you were talking about uh, philosophers, Greg. There's a guy named Ryan Holiday, and I've read all of his books. I think he's awesome. And he has a, a little saying that has become my motto over the past few years. And it's, if we hesitate at the moment of crisis, we accomplish nothing and we save no one. So think about that. All right. Thanks for another good one, fellas, and see you next time. The behavior panel. Greg, did you hear what you said in there? What, looking stupid every now and then? No, you said, Chase just told you how the brain works and how certain things shut off. You don't need to know any of that. <laughs> to, to do, no, I'm saying you don't have to know it to use it. I know, but I okay. couldn't help but crack up. Sorry if it came off that way, not the way I intended it. Because some people are not going to learn brain function. Oh, I know. The behavior panel. Today, I'm gonna. I'm getting to where I'm prepped for when you say that, and so today I don't think I'm gonna laugh. All right, I don't see. think so. Okay. I thought about it all day yesterday. Why? why what doesn't bother me? Why it makes me laugh? I don't know why. Because it's nothing, but it gives me shits and giggles. So I just kept saying it over and over and over in your voice. How does that sound? I don't know. It's in here. I can't get it out. <laughs> it's in it's yeah. A little chase in your head. Everybody, yeah, okay. everybody I, should have a little chase in their head. I told you I've got a Dr. <laughs> Phil in my head. Did I tell you about that? No. So anyway, people kept saying on my channel, they're going, you're losing weight. Are you okay? You seem like you're losing weight really fast. And I read half of that Dr. Phil book, you know, the seven keys to losing weight order. Let me tell you something. Man, I had to quit halfway through because it started, got, he got up in my head. And then for the past few months, every time I see something that's like, you know, I want to eat like, you know, like Reese cups or something like that, you know, or if I want to go to Waffle House, I just hear him, a hand to God, I hear him go, you really want to eat that? You really? That's a lot. Come of to bread. my house. I'll fix it for you. I told you. Just come here. I d I don't. I don't know, man. I can't. Bye. And now I'm. I'm just losing weight. You know. And I was like, that's It scared me. I was like, maybe something's wrong with me. So I started eating a lot. And I gained like five pounds. I was like, okay, it's not me. It's not anything's wrong with me. I'm just losing weight. It's like I'm a very one now. Like a very large Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's got the book and the whole, you know, that thing right there and the whole thing. Are you sure you won't eat that? I mean, I hear him saying that. It's just so weird. And he never says that in the book. That's the thing. But he does talk about why you want to eat and all those things, you know? I don't know. I don't know, man. Freak me out. So I got to be cool. And now I'm just eating for one. Nope.